Welcome back to the Cisco NetAcad CCNA Switching, Routing and Wireless Essentials lecture series. If you haven't seen my previous lectures, I will leave a link in the description for the playlist. I would also recommend that you watch the Introduction to Networks lecture series before you move forward with this course. Today I will cover module number 14 which is Routing Concepts. The primary objective of this module is to explain how routers use information in packets to make forwarding decisions. We will cover how the path determination works. We will learn how the packet forwarding works. We will learn how we can configure a basic router. We will cover the topic of IP tables and static and dynamic routing. Path determination. Two functions of a router. When a router receives an IP packet on one interface, it determines which interface to use to forward the packet to the destination. This is known as routing. The interface that the router uses to forward the packet may be final destination or maybe a network connected to another router that is used to reach the destination network. So it can be something like an end device or so router may be connected uh, between two end devices so it may be communicating to end to end or it could be communicating with another router such as your ISP routers to reach your another destination. So that could be interconnected networks for example. Each network that a router connects to typically requires a separate interface but this may not always be the case because there are also options of attaching routers to virtual interfaces as well. The primary functions of a routers are to determine the best path to forward packets based on the information in its routing table and to forward packets towards their destination. So this is a key piece of information that you should learn. So the primary function, if the Cisco CCNA or CCNP exams or your instructor asks you what is the primary function of a router? Well, the primary functions of a router to determine the best path to forward packets based on the information in its routing table and to forward packets towards the destinations because what we are studying in this Cisco class is basically Cis, uh, the packet switching, right? So this is packet switch networks and the purpose of the device called router is to find the best path to switch those packets or send those packets. So that's a key piece of information. Router functions example. The router uses its IP routing table to determine which path or route to use to forward packets. So in this diagram on the right hand side, the R1 and R2 will use their respective IP routing tables to first determine the best path and then forward the packet. So on the right hand side you have this network, you have the R1 and you have the R2 and they are connected across the, you know, we have some kind of a connection and then we have a local area behind R2 and you have a local area behind R1. So we have two local area networks that are interconnected between each other using two routers. On router one, if you look at the configuration under show IP route command, you can display what kind of routing is happening here. And right here, we see that they have used the path, uh, you know, this router have selected that path where, you know, the routing gonna happen across this network. So this is the path that they have chosen. So this is a useful command that you can use in labs to check what kind of, uh, you know, um, best path is used by your device. So that's an example uh, shown as a screenshot. But again, I will go through these labs on separate videos. But yeah, that's an example of, you know, how you can check that information. Best path equals to longest match. So the best path in the routing table is also known as the longest match. And there's a reason for that. 
The routing table contains route entries consists of a prefix, which is the network address and the prefix length. For there to be a match between the destination IP address of a packet and a route in the routing table, a minimum number of far left bits must match between the IP address of the packet and the route in the routing table. The prefix length of the route in the routing table is used to determine the maximum number of far left bits that must match. So the longest match is the route in the routing table that has the greatest number of far left matching bits with the destination IP address of the packet. The longest match is always preferred route. So the longest match is the always preferred route. So therefore the term uh, the prefix length will be used to refer to the network portion of both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. And uh, you know, that's a term that you will hear in this class as well as my next few classes as we go through these lectures. So for now, just remember why we call best path is also equal to the longest match. That because of in routing table, we have route entries consists of a prefix which is a network address and a prefix length and therefore to be have a match between the destination IP address and a packet um, you know and the destination MAC address address of a packet and a routing table a minimum number of far left bits must be matched so that's what you need to remember um, I will be posting a separate more comprehensive video uh, that is complementary to Cisco classes, but is not part of a Cisco slide set on uh, subnetting uh, and as well as prefixes and how you can separate network portion from the you know host portion of a IP address and etc. Later sometime, but for now, uh, just remember the best part is also equal to the longest match and the reason behind it. In our next few slides, we will look into how uh, these are done uh, in, uh, you know, how this IPv4 uh, longest match works. Uh, but you will get more familiar with this as we go through other lectures as well, especially the, my lecture on uh, subnetting and prefixes. But next few slides, we will briefly go over uh, how, uh, you know, the binary numbers uh, works with respect to IP addresses. So IPv4 longest match example. In the table below, you can see there is an IPv4 packet that has the destination IPv4 address of 172.16.0.10. And it's right here. This is the destination IP address. And you can also see it's binary written on the right hand side under address in binary. So the router has three route entries in its IPv4 routing table that match this packet. They include the 172.16.0.0/12, and 172.16.0.0/26. So they have once those three items. So they, they have three matching routes in the routing table. Of the three routes, the 172.16.0.0/26 has the longest match and would be chosen to forward the packet. So if you look at these three routes, this one has the longest match to the destination IPv4 address. Because if you look at the 172.16.0.10 and it's binary and you compare with 172.16.0.0/26, you can see the longest match. It has the most matching positions in the binary. And therefore, that would be the one that would be chosen to forward the packet. For any of these routes to be considered a match, there must be at least the number of matching bits indicated by the subnet mask of the route. So at least the number of bits, you know, uh, that is indicated by the subnet mask of the route has to match between the destination IPv4 address and the, you know, the, uh, the, the routing entry uh, you know route entry that we have here so that is a key thing that you should also learn again 
it's kind of confusing if you just go to this lecture only and just listen to me speaking about reading off of a slide like this. So that's why I will be posting a separate video on subnetting and how the binary formats work and how prefixes works on my YouTube channel later. And again, when I post that, I will try to leave a card here up here on the right hand corner or leave a link in this video's description so you'll have a better understanding of it. Right now, I assume you have a very good understanding of how subnetting works and you are very good at uh, converting decimal numbers into binary formats. And you, uh, I assume that you know how this, uh, you know, these uh, binary formats works, okay? So, because this is an advanced class, this is an advanced course, I expect you to know certain things that if you're not familiar with, it may be difficult for you to understand, okay? So, I'm sorry about that, but however, I will post separate videos associated with subnetting and binary numbers uh, later sometime. So the IPv6 longest match example uh, in here, uh, an IPv6 packet has the destination IPv6 address of 2001 colon DB8 colon C000 double colon 99, right? So that is the, the destination IPv6 address. This example shows three route entries, but only two of them are valid match with one of these being the longest match. The first two route entries have prefix lengths that have the required number of matching bits as indicated by the prefix length. The third route entry is not a match because its slash 64 prefix requires 64 matching bits. So in here we have a destination uh, I'm at IPv6 address now instead of IPv4 and which is 2001 colon db so on and so forth at slash 48 and we have uh, the three route entries in IPv6 in this particular router and you see the this one does not match at the 64 bits uh, because it's slash 64 and it doesn't match all the way to this one. So this one does match up to 48. It has a 48 bits match and it has the longest match here. And this one is 40 bits and it doesn't match uh, as much as this one, but this, this, but they are kind, they both matches, but this one has the longest match. Again, if I was a student who just look at this table, I guarantee you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I will post a separate video explaining this in much more comprehensive way, but unfortunately this is what the Cisco actually provided to us as a slide uh, for this advanced class. Remember, because we are in Cisco NetaCAD CCNA switching routing and wireless essentials lecture series. Uh, this is a, an, an advanced or intermediate level CCNA program. So that's why they are just like plain um, data just giving up to you. So. I know it's it's not very good, so I will post a separate video on this as well. But for now, just remember, both IPv4 and IPv6 use the longest match to route its packets. So how do you build the routing table? Uh, so directly connected networks, uh, the, what, that's gonna, what's gonna happen there is added to the routing table when a local interface is configured with an IP address and subnet mask, or the, also known as a prefix length, and is active and up. So, so that basically means is that if you have a router that have directly connected uh, networks, directly connected devices, and what's going to happen you know, on the local interface, as long as the interface is active, that means the administratively up and the connection is there. And so that means both are, it's up and running. That will be automatically added to the routing table because it's in directly in contact with that local interface. So for example, if you plug in a end device, such as your laptop onto your router straight directly, or through a, even through a switch or something, 
because your router sees that as a direct link to its uh, you know interface it will automatically add that information to its routing table so those are called directly connected network exactly what it sounds like that directly connected devices or network the other one called the remote networks so the networks that are not directly connected to the router uh, are called remote networks and the router learns about the remote networks in two ways one called static routes the other one called dynamic routing protocol so in static route method uh, the router would add uh, the to the routing table when the route is manually configured so as a system administrator or network technician you'd go into a cisco router or other routers uh, and then you add a static route and that static route could be uh, you know on the uh, it would be in a remote network and now the router would know uh, that remote network exists and it it is a route that you have manually configured the other option called the dynamic routing protocols uh, which add to the routing table when the routing protocols dynamically learn about remote networks so it's it's an automatic process of learning remote networks and adding it to the routing table so remember that so the remote network has two types of adding the remote network information uh, that are not connect directly not connected to your router and how the router going to do that is either through static route or through dynamic routing protocol the next one is called default route uh, which specify a next hop router to use when the routing table does not contain a specific route that make matches the destination IP address. The default route can be entered manually as a static route or learned automatically from a dynamic routing protocol. Uh, so this is something that I sometimes use to fix issues with some of my labs. Uh, but that's not the best option but that's the one way of fixing some of the things that you are trying to uh, you know work with so a default route has a slash zero prefix length this mean that has uh, so, sorry this mean that no bits need to match the destination ip address for the route entry to be used remember pre on previous slides we learned that the certain bits needs to be matched in order for the route entry to be used but because this is a slash zero length prefix that means that there are no bits needed to be needed to be match uh, the destination ip address so if there are no routes with a match longer than zero bits the default route is used to forward the packet the default route is sometimes referred to as a gateway of last resort so in my lab demonstrations and when i go through these lectures i may use either default route or gateway of last resort either or term terms to describe the same thing so in this class in this course for your lectures and lab exams you should know the differences between the directly connected networks remote networks default routes and their specifications and how they operate and you should also know that the remote networks can be static routes or can be dynamic routing protocols. So those are key pieces of information that you should remember uh, for your exams and quizzes. Packet forwarding. Packet forwarding decision process. So in this slide, what Cisco is trying to explain to us is the decision process the router will go through when it is forwarding packets uh, as it receives them. So in this diagram on the right hand side, it has some steps uh, with a nicely laid out uh, example. And then that would explain on the left hand side with some information on how this decision in process work. So when the packet is received by your router in the inputting interface that means the ingress interface remember from the previous lectures ingress stands for inputting and exiting interface is known as egress interface or exiting interface so when the router first receive the packet 
uh from uh, from the, the in the on the interface which which is the inputting uh, of that packet ingress interface the first thing it's going to do is look at the sector sections of that packet so we have a data link header we have the destination ip address we have the rest of the ip packet and then we have the data link trailer then the router examines the destination ip address in the packet header and consult its ip routing table Remember, we learned in our previous slide how the IP routing tables are made. So now the router actually going to use that routing table to check if there is a match in this routing table that is associated with this destination IP address. So the route, if the router finds the longest matching prefix in the routing table, what's going to happen is the router going to uh, to encapsulate the packet in a data link frame and forward it out the egress interface or the exiting interface. So if this IP address matches to an entry in this routing table, it's gonna have the information about the exiting interface that it needs to be forwarding. So the, what the router gonna do, it's gonna encapsulate that packet in a data link frame and forward it out the that exiting interface. So the destination could be a device that is connected to the network or the next hop router. So this matching IP address may belong to an end device such as your laptop or a computer or a printer, some kind of a device, for example. Or it could be a, the next hop um, uh, you know, router. It could be another router from your ISP or somewhere else, for example. So this is the four steps for forwarding packet. But however, if there is no matching route entry, the packet is then gonna get dropped from your router. So again, this is a really good summary of how packet forwarding decision process works on your router. So I will quickly go over again. The packet comes in, the router examine the destination IP address within that packet, see if it matches with the routing table, if it does match with an entry within the routing table, it knows which um, exiting interface or egress that needs to be sent out. So it's gonna encapsulate it and send it out that interface to the destination. It could be an end device or the next hop router. But if there is no match for this IP address in its routing table, the router will then discard that packet. However, uh, that May, you know that is not going to happen if you have a default route or something else uh, that is set up uh, the default route is set up in your router so that we will discuss that in a later uh, but for now that's the process that you should know after a router has determined the best path it could do the following forward the packet to a device on a directly connected network so in this case if the router entry indicates that the exiting interface is a directly connected network, the packet can be forwarded directly to the destination device. This is basically what is happening in Ethernet LAN. The encapsulate the uh, so to encapsulate the packet in the Ethernet frame, the router needs to determine the destination MAC address associated with the destination IP address of the packet. The process varies based on whether the packet is an IPv4 or IPv6 packet. It could also forward the packet to a next hop router, as I mentioned in my previous slides. So if the router uh, in, uh, figure out that it need going into a next hop router, so the route entry would indicate that the destination IP address is a remote network, meaning a device on network that is not directly connected. So what's gonna happen in here is the packet must be forwarded to the next top router. The next top address is indicated on the router entry, sorry, route entry. So if the forwarding router and the next top router are on the an ethernet network, a similar process uh, will occur to determine the destination MAC address of the packet as described previously. So 
the process would include ARP and ICMP v6 neighbor discovery. Remember, we have gone through them on our previous lectures. If you don't remember ARP and ICMP v6 uh, ND, you should uh, check my previous lecture. But the process is basically similar. So the difference is that the router will search for the IP address of the next stop router in its ARP table or neighbor cache instead of the destination IP of the packet. So in here, as opposed to the previous example where the packet get forwarded to a device that is directly connected, when you compare that to a packet that being going into a next top router, the major difference is that the route in, in when it is forward into the next top router, the router will search for the IP address of the next top router in its ARP table or the ND cache or neighbor cache instead of the destination IP address of the packet. Because directly connected, you can use the destination IP address of the packet, but in next top, you can't. Please note this process will vary for other types of layer two networks. So keep it that in mind. Another option is to drop the packet because there is no match in the routing table. So if there is no match between the destination IP address and a prefix in the routing table, and if there is no default route setup, then the packet will be dropped. So the key piece of information here is that, especially when we are doing labs, we may create some default routes to get, you know, get around this issue. Uh, so the packet only gonna get dropped if there is no match in the routing table and its destination IP address, or uh, there is no default route. That's when the, uh, the packet get dropped. So just because of, uh, there are no match between destination IP address and the prefix in the routing table, it's not gonna get dropped if there is a default route. So keep that in mind because that's, keep that in back of your mind because that's gonna come up on your labs and lectures uh, as we go through these courses. End-to-end -end packet forwarding. The primary responsibility of the packet forwarding function is to encapsulate packets in the appropriate data link frame type for the outgoing interface. So I'm gonna repeat that again. The primary responsibility of the packet forwarding function is to encapsulate packets in a, the appropriate data link frame type for outgoing interface. And the remember the prim primary function of a router is basically to packet forwards, packet switched your network because we are doing packet switching in networking, right? So that's why. So for example, the data link frame format for a serial link could be point to point protocol, also known as PPP, high level data link control protocol, also known as HDLC, or some other layer two protocol. So remember that the data link frame format for a serial link could be point to point high level data link control, or it could be some other layer two protocol. So next we're gonna look at packet forwarding mechanisms. So the primary responsibility of the packet forwarding function is to encapsulate packets in the appropriate data link frame for type for outgoing interface, right? The more efficiently the router can perform this particular task, the faster the packet can be forwarded by the router. Because in nowadays, especially in 2022, our entire goal in the industry to make the system as fast as possible, right? So the more efficiently a router can perform the this task is the faster the packet can be forwarded by the router. And this is a very key research area currently by research by many, many people because this is how you get faster networks. Routers support the following three packet forwarding mechanisms process switching, fast switching, and uh, there's a Cisco proprietary one called the Cisco Express Forwarding, also known as CEF. And the next few slides, uh, I will go through them uh, briefly, like a high level overview, so that you have an understanding about differences between process switching, fast switching, and Cisco Express Forwarding. So process switching, 
This is an older packet forwarding mechanism still available for Cisco routers. When a packet arrives on an interface, it forwarded to the control plane where the CPU matches the destination address with an entry in its routing table and then determines the exit interface and forward the packet. So basically, when the packet arrives on any interface, it is going to get forwarded to the control plane where the CPU matches the destination IP address with an entry in its routing table. So basically, the CPU is doing its work to match them out. So it is important to understand that the router does this for every single packet, even if the destination is the same for the stream of packets. So if you have an interface in process switching, uh, what happened if that the ingress interface, that means incoming interface, have multiple packets coming in. In this example, we have five packets coming in. Every single of those packets going to go through the control plane and the CPU going to process every single one of those packets and going to check where it needed to be exiting out of and it's going to pretty much going to bypass data plane. So it's just going to go everything, every single frame going to go through the control plane. None of the packets are going to go straight through the data plane. Even after the first packet is decided, the next packet is still going to go through that decision process over and over again. So it's going to use a, a lot of CPU power because CPU is the one that is matching the destination address with an entry on its routing table. So that is called the process switching. That is the way that the process switching work, right? So remember, this is one of the oldest method of packet forwarding. Then we have a method called fast switching. So the fast switching is a another older packet forwarding mechanism, which was the successor to the process switching. Fast switching uses a fast switching cache to store next hop information. When a packet arrives on an interface, it is forwarded to the control plane where the CPU searches for a match in the fast switching cache. If it is not there, it is process switch and forwarded to the next interface. Oh, sorry, forwarded to the exit interface, right? But however, the flow information for the packet is then stored in the fast switching cache. If another packet going to the same exact destination arrives on an interface, the next stop information on the cache is reused without the use of CPU power. So basically, this is an advantage because now if you have an inputting inf interface or ingress interface and receive a packet that needs to go to an egress interface, a specific destination, and once a CPU has determined where, where that destination is, it's going to build that forward cache. So once there is an entry in the forward cache, instead of every single packet going through the control plane, like on our previous method of uh, uh, switching, which is the process switching, in this case, what's going to happen is once this first packet went, goes through, when the second packet and third packet and fourth packet, fifth packet and so on and so forth arrives with the in that interface with that same destination, it's going to use that cache to fast forward that data. So this is better than the, the, the process switching because it uses less uh, CPU power, uh, hence it's faster and it mostly used the data plane once it's figured out where the destination is. And the next one is called Cisco Express Forwarding or CEF, which is a Cisco proprietary, obviously with the name on it, you can probably figure that out. However, this is the most recent and default Cisco iOS packet forwarding mechanism. So if you have Cisco routers in your network, Cisco Express Forwarding or CEF is the one that is by default set to uh, be used by your systems. So the CEF builds a forwarding information base, also known as FIB, and an adjacency table. So it has two components there. So we have, a, it's going to build the forwarding information base, FIB, and an adjacency, adjacency table. The table entries are not 
packet triggered like the fast switching but change triggered such as when something changes in the network topology it will gonna get triggered when a network has converged the fib and adjacency tables contain all the information that a router would have to consider when forwarding packets so basically it doesn't go through the control plane at all even the very first packet it received so when you have convergence of your network the fib and adjacency table get built on uh, in cisco express forwarding and once it is built it's basically not only going to get triggered the table entries are not going to get packet triggered like the fast uh, switching but instead it's going to get change triggered it's only going to get triggered when there is some kind of a changes to your network topology and once the change of the net network topology has been converged again and again the F fib and the adjacency table are going to get built and now when the ingress interface receives those packets it doesn't go through the control plane and does not need the um, the, the use of cpu it's just going to go straight across the data plane every single packet out to the ingress interface so those are the three types that you should know for this class and you should know the differences uh, between the cef fast switching and process switching you should know the process switching is the older method and it got uh, replaced by the fast switching uh, and what are the differences between those two and the, the what is the advantage of using cef or cisco express forwarding so you should know them like back of your hand for your exams uh, and your quizzes basic router configuration review so in this topology um, we have two routers so router one here and router two here and then we have a isp router which is a remote router and this will be used in the next few uh, discussions that we're gonna look at and uh, this is where the lab comes into play in uh, a lot in this module again i will build this topology on a cisco packet tracer or even g and i will go through this process on a separate video but for now remember this topology because next few slides don't have the image of this topology however we will be discussing this topology and how we can configure these routers uh, and uh, configurations on next few slides so we have a pc here a switch here which is connected to the this router router one and we have pc here and a switch here and it's also connected to this r1 and on the other network that is connected across a another router here uh, we have the pc here we connected to the switch 2 and a pc here connected to the same switch 2 and that switch 2 is now connected to the outside router provided by your I, the, on in the isp so that is the basic topology and you should roughly remember these ip addresses as well uh, what i would do if you're studying this for the first time and you don't have access to this slide set for example uh, i would take a screenshot of this and have it on the side of your screen or somewhere so that you have an idea about what i'm talking about in next few slides because this is an important diagram that uh, that describe the topology that we are working on next few slides configuration commands so this is basically should be a review for you some of these commands because we have gone through them in my previous lecture series as well as this lecture series and i will go through them in my lab demonstration as well so when you take a router right out of the box especially cisco routers you will have the default host name with just router like that and now what you need to do is you need to change some configurations host names and stuff like that so the first step we're going to do with the router one on our topology so if you look at the topology here we are looking at this router right now we are working on this router so what we're going to do we're going to go into cli uh, and then we're going to go enable or en and we're going to go config terminal or config t that is a short form and then you're going to enter the host name so again there are short forms and cisco is using here long form so it's host name and we're going to rename it to r1 because it's very convenient and easy to remember and it matches with our topology name so 
you can use hor1 hor1 or just you can type hostname r1 and we're gonna secure the router so you're gonna go to the security process so we're gonna enable the passwords in here is the line console passwords as well and line vty passwords and we also uh, do the password uh, service password encryption uh, here uh, and we also enter the banner MOTD. Uh, so all of this is a basic configuration of any router that you're gonna take right out of the box as any Cisco router that you take out right out of the box, right? So next we're gonna do, what we will uh, do is to set up this router one or R1 to, uh, you know, do what we need to do uh, to make this network works, right? As it described here. So the first thing is we're gonna issue the command IPv6 unicast routing because that will enable the IPv6 routing. Again, I have gone through this in my previous videos. Please go and watch it. And when I post my uh, lab videos, I will go through them again so that you have an understanding of how this works. So next we're gonna go into the interface. 000, zero zero because if you look at this diagram if you look at here the interface 000, zero zero is right here so we're gonna go in there which is the gigabit 000, zero zero and we're gonna name it so it's easy so it is a link to LAN one why because this 000, zero zero is linked to this LAN one this is the LAN one this is the LAN two right so that's right so we're gonna name link convenient name and we're gonna give the IP address associated with that. We're gonna give the IPv6 address associated. And most importantly, a lot of students forget this during lab exams, you have to issue the no shutdown command. If you do not, this just because of you enter this information doesn't mean that port is active, that interface is active, that interface probably inactive most likely. So you're gonna issue the no shutdown command. Then you're gonna go to the next interface, do the same process and the, you're gonna go to the next interface and do the same process. And finally, don't forget to do the copy running config, startup config. Again, there are short forms for this, copy run config and copy st uh, start config, for example. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna save this into the memory of your router. So when, if the router get rebooted or for power cycles for whatever reason, it will have this configuration saved because if you don't do this, what's gonna happen is if power cycles or router get rebooted, you're gonna lose everything that you have done up here. So make sure you do that. Again, I won't go through this in the any more detail, but you know, you should know this by now because we've already gone through a lot of uh, theory associated with this and I will do this lab on a separate video. There are verification commands that you can use to verify what you did there was correct. So the common verification commands that we're gonna use is a show IP interface brief, show running config interface, then you can enter the interface, whatever the interface that you're gonna look at. Uh, so you show running dash config interface, F face G000 for example, or G000 uh, for an example. Uh, you can use the show interfaces, show IP interface, show IP route, and you can obviously use the ping. Ping is like the most common basic fundamental command that all of you should be using for testing and troubleshooting your uh, network, right? Remember as network technicians and engineers, ping is our good friend for every single time we have a connectivity issue or you need to test your connectivity, right? So the other one is the trace route, which is not here uh, as uh, shown here by Cisco, but that's another one I use. So in each case, we replace IP with IPv6 for the IPv6 version of that command in Cisco iOS. So if you have a Cisco iOS device like a router or a switch, you can basically put IPv6 um, uh, uh, instead of IP and it would uh, do the same thing. So you can go show IPv6 interface brief or show IPv6 interface and that or show IPv6 route, it'll show the IPv6 uh, information. So you can in each case replace just IP with IPv6 and these commands would work. The filter command output. 
So a filtering command can be used to display specific sections of output. Again, I have already gone through this and Cisco is just nailing that to your head so that you won't forget. So uh, to enable the filtering command, we use the pipe character after show command and then enter a filtering parameter and a filtering expression. So because Cisco IOS is basically based on Linux Unix type of system. Uh, so that's why you may be familiar with this pipe command from your Linux uh, classes. If you're taking any uh, Ubuntu or a, a Red Hat or any other classes, and you know, that may be why you are maybe familiar with that. I have some Linux videos in my uh, YouTube channel as well. You can go ahead and watch them if you want to learn a little bit of Linux. So, so the filtering parameters that can be configured after that pipe, so the, this, this character, the pipe character, is selection that would display the entire, se uh, sorry, section, <coughs> section uh, that would display the entire section that starts with the filtering expression. So you enter the section, you type the section and then you enter the expression what you want to match. Include, this would include all output lines that match the filtering expression. Exclude, this would exclude all output lines that match the filtering expression. Begin, this would display all output lines from a certain point starting with the line that matches the filtering expression. In other words, like it will look for an item or expression uh, that start with that and then start displaying everything below it. Please note the output filters can be used in combination with any show command. So you can use any of these output with any show command. So if you go back in here <coughs> to the previous slide, if you go show interfaces and you can use the pipe right after it, and then you can say include, and then you can give the exact interface that you are looking at, or you know show IP route and you're gonna use a specific um, you know, you can exclude certain IP routes because you already know it, they were working, for example. So that's what the pipe command does. And it will like, you know, filter that information for you because otherwise sometimes, here's another thing about this filter, filtering and the pipe character. If you have a router in a, the production environment, in other words, the router is in use, and if you run a command that would generate a lot of data from the Cisco CLI, the output, that could have a negative impact on your end users, especially in a corporate environment. If you have like large number of users connected to a one single router, that happens, especially in small businesses, and you run a command that's gonna show up a whole bunch of um, you know, troubleshooting data on your Cisco device, that's gonna use up some CPU that may have a negative impact on especially VoIP phones and also uh, other high bandwidth uh, users because the, the C, now the CPU is working twice as hard or more harder than what it used to be, right? So the pipe command would help you to also mitigate, uh, you know, having your device uh, outputting way too much data as all, also uh, help you uh, narrow down what uh, you know items uh, of interest so whatever the items of interest so that's uh, an important thing that you should remember there is a packet tracer file available through your cisco netacad called basic router configuration review if you have access to this packet tracer file please go ahead and download and do them if you do not i will try to find a copy and post to my website sanuja.com so that you can go ahead and do it again i will go through these packet tracer files on separate videos later sometime ip routing table route sources a routing table contains a list of routes to known networks. Prefixes and prefix length would be in their routing table. The source of this information is derived from the following. Directly connected network, static routes, and dynamic routing protocols. We briefly went over these three types on our previous slides. The source for each route in the routing table is identified by a code. 
the common codes includes the following. So if you are using a Cisco router, these are the common codes you're gonna see within your routing tables on your Cisco device. So the L identifies the address assigned to a router interface. C identifies a directly connected network. S identifies a static route created to reach a specific network. O identifies a dynamically learned network from another router using the OSPF routing protocol. Star, which is this one, it's really hard to see here on the screen sometimes, so this, this one. Uh, this route is a candidate for a default route. So it's just a, a candidate for a default route. So this is an important slide that would help you in your lab exams. So when you are looking at the routing table of a Cisco router uh, during your lab exam to either troubleshoot your issue or your instructor ask you to show you the uh, the routing table so the, he's looking at or he or she is looking at certain information to uh, check your grades this is what your instructor is probably looking at they were looking i try to identify these l c s o and the stars on your routing table and see if it matches with what you should be getting if you have done the lab exam correctly so these are important things that you should remember uh, for use to also troubleshoot if you ever run into an issue with your labs. So remember that. Routing table principles. There are three routing table principles as described in the table. These are issues that are addressed by proper configuration of dynamic routing protocols or static routes on all routers between the source and destination devices. So on this table, we have a column with the routing table principles and on the right hand side, there are some examples. So uh, the every router makes a decision alone based on the information it has in its own routing table. So example is that R1 can only forward packets using its own routing table and R1 does not know the routes uh, in the routing tables of other routers such as the R2 from our previous topology that we looked at, right? So the next principle is the the information in the routing table of the of one router does not necessarily match the routing table of another router. So that means the data within a, a routing table of a one router doesn't necessarily need to match with the data within another uh, routing table in another router. So just because of R1 has route in its uh, routing table to a network in the internet via R2, that does not mean that the R2 knows about the same network. So the R1 probably knows, maybe the R2 also knows, but it doesn't necessarily mean the R2 knows about that uh, network. So that's an example there. And the next concept is the routing information about a path does not provide a return routing information. So the routing information about a specific path from source to destination doesn't mean that it also provides the destination to the source routing information that in the backwards, you know. So R, for example, the R1 receives a packet with the destination IP yeah, address of PC1 from our previous topology and the source IP address of PC3. Just because of the R1 knows how to forward the packet out uh, through its G000 interface, it doesn't necessarily mean that it knows how to forward packets originating from PC1 back to the remote network of PC3. So remember that. So just because of the router knows how to forward the packet, uh, from PC3 to PC1 doesn't mean it can also uh, automatically do the uh, forwarding uh, from PC1 to PC3. So the backward, uh, if, if a packet is going from source to destination doesn't mean the packet can uh, be sent from destination to the source just because of one way is working already. So next we're gonna look at the routing table entries. So in here on the right hand side, we have an example of a routing table entry uh, right here for IPv4. And we have an example of a IPv6 routing table entry. 
So on a Cisco router, you can run the command show IP route or show IPv6 route, and that would give you multiple entries with this routing information. And now we're gonna break it apart into those separate components that compose of that one of those entries and look at how we can understand what the Cisco CLI uh, would display, right? So in here, on the most left-hand side, where it label as number one, we see the route source. So the route source is the one that would identify how the route was learned. And we learn about those different letters and what it means on our previous slide. And also there's an option of that star entry, which is a default route. Uh, so that will also indicate that information using this entry. The next entry, which is labeled as two right here, is the destination network and it includes the prefix and the prefix length. So in here we have the destination network and the prefix information. So this identifies the address of the remote network and uh, that would display right next to the route source. The next one, which is the number three, that is the administrative distance. This identifies the trustworthiness of the source route. Lower the value, that indicates the preferred route source. So you should remember that. So lower this value that is preferred, more preferred by uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, the router. The next one is the matrix. So matrix is the, uh, it's a type of matrix that identifies the value assigned to the uh, reach of the remote network. So it identifies the value assigned to reach the remote network. Again, the lower this value, it prefer it shows the preferred route. So lower this value, that is the preferred route. So that's why the administrative distance and matrix come into play. Uh, these two items become more um, important in our future courses and future lectures. Uh, but for now, just know what the administrative distance and matrix means. And we will learn about, we will use uh, these um, uh, items for certain configurations in our advanced routing routing courses. So for now, just know what they are and what they mean, mean uh, generally for routing packets. The next option uh, shown here is the VIA option. So it's in with that, there is some uh, information associated with that and IP address. And that would be the next hop information. This identifies the IP address of the next router to which the packet would be forwarded. So that, that would be that one. And then the next one is the time. That is the timestamp. This identifies how much time has been passed since the route was learned. So since this router has learned this route, how much time that has been passed. Finally, it shows the exit interface or egress interface, exiting interface. This identifies the egress interface to use for outgoing packets to reach their final destination. So that's what it looks like on a, a Cisco router. If you run the command show IP route, this is one of the entries that you may see and that's what it's displaying. So for show IPv6 route command, that will show up as this. And that will also have those same functions. For example, the very first, uh, uh, you know, set of information on the left hand side when you read from left to right is the route source, uh, and then the next one will show you the destination network, uh, and you will see the administrative distances matrix, next stop, uh, the timestamp uh, is uh, the only one uh, that is not actually displayed here on the IPv6 information, uh, but uh, every, you know, the timestamp is basically uh, not part of the IPv6 routing table, but it is part of the IPv4 because of the way that the IPv6 and IPv4 routing tables work. So that's why it's not uh, displayed on the IPv6, okay? So please note the prefix length of the destination network specify the maximum number of far left bits that must be matched between the IP address of the packet and the destination network, in other words, the prefix for this route to be used. So know that as well. So in this 
page in this slide what you need to understand is these different types of items that shows up when you run either show ip route it for ip v4 and show ip v6 route for ip v6 uh, routing tables and also know that the ipv6 routing table doesn't have the timer so that the number six unit is not shown on here because it's not part of the ipv6 routing why because that's the way ipv6 routing works if you understand how the differences between how ipv4 packets are switched and ipv6 packets are switched uh, you will understand why it's not that important the timer so Again, if you don't remember IPv4, IPv6 concepts, like the basic fundamentals, you can watch my previous videos. Directly connected networks. To learn about any remote networks, the router must have at least one active interface configured with an IP address and subnet mask, right? To learn about any remote networks, the router must have at least one active interface configured with an IP address and a subnet mask. Otherwise, it won't be able to do that. This is known as the directly connected network or directly connected route. Routers add a directly connected route to its routing table when an interface is configured with an IP address and is activated. So the interface has to be activated and active and it has to be uh, you know, configured properly in order for it to receive that information. So a directly connected network is uh, noted by a status code of C in the routing table. The route contains a network prefix and prefix length. So in the routing table on here on the first column from the left hand side, you will see a C symbol instead of an O symbol here. The Routing table also contains a local route for each of its directly connected networks, which is indicated by the status code L. So that's another one that you will see. So C here and a L here. For IPv4 local routes, the prefix length is slash 32. And for IPv6 local routes, the prefix length is slash 128. This means the destination IP address of the packet must match all the bits in the local route for this route to be matched. The purpose of the local route is to efficiently determine when it receives a packet for the interface instead of a packet that needs to be forwarded. So if during an exam or during a lab exam, if your instructor asks you, what is the primary purpose of a local route? This is the answer. The purpose of the local route is to efficiently determine when it receives a packet for the interface instead of a packet that needs to be forwarded. So it will be able to identify that. So that's the purpose of a local route. Static routes. So after directly connected interfaces are configured and added to the routing table, static or dynamic routing can be implemented for accessing remote networks. Static routes are manually configured. They define an explicit path between two networking devices. They are not automatically updated and must be manually configured if the network topology changes. So if you have any static routes within your Cisco routers uh, or any other routing devices, what you need to make sure is that if you change your networking topology, you need to make sure to go back and if anything needed to be changed on those static routes, you have to manually configure it again to make sure that it, your network works properly. Because there are static routes that are manually entered by either network administrator or network technician, right? So that's why. Static routing has three primary uses. It provides ease of routing table maintenance in smaller networks that are not expected to grow significantly. It uses a single default route to represent a path to any network that does not have a more specific match with another route in routing table. Default routes are used to send traffic to any destination beyond the next upstream router. It routes to and from stub network. A stub network is a network accessed by a single route and the router has only one neighbor. So 
these are three primary uses for static routing. So these are very important concepts that you understand for your exams and quizzes again. So static route provides an ease of routing table maintenance in smaller networks that are not expected to grow significantly. So you can manually configure or reconfigure those static route easily. And it uses a single default route to represent a path to any network that does not have a more specific match with another route in the routing table. So it makes the routing faster and easier in this situation. The default routes are used to send traffic to any destination beyond the next upstream router. And it routes to and from stub networks and you should know what a stub network is, like in a high level overview, it is a network accessed by a single route and the router has only one neighbor. Again, these are basic concepts. We are only going through the overview of routing. Uh, we, again, we will cover OSPF and other advanced routing, BGP and everything on a separate course series. But for now, this is what you need to understand for this course. Static routes in IP routing table. The topology in this figure, in the in the, this figures that shown on here on on the bottom of your screen right here, is simplified to show only one LAN attached to each router. The figure shows IPv4 and IPv6 static routes configured on R1 to reach 10.0.4.0/24 .0 and IPv6 uh, here uh, address of 2001 db8 ac80 blah, so and so on network on the R2. Right, so we have two net, uh, uh, network, one for IPv6 and one for IPv4, right? So this diagram shows a static routes in a routing table, how that can be configured. So in here we have a static route, enter for IPv6 with the IP route command on your Cisco route in configuration mode. And we have a static route of 10.0.4.0.255.255.255.0 matching to 10.3.2. And for uh, IPv6, uh, the similar one, but now we are using IPv6 route with, with command with that uh, respective information. So we have the remote IPv4 and network address right here from here to here. And we have the IPv4 address of the next hop router. That's the static route that we are creating in the routing table. And the same thing happening for IPv6, but now we are dealing with IPv6. We are using the slash notation here. And uh, it also has the IPv6 address for the next hop router. So that's how you create the static routes in the IP routing table. Dynamic routing protocols. So the dynamic routing protocols are used by routers to automatically share information about the reachability and status of remote networks. Dynamic routing protocols perform several activities, including network discovery and maintaining routing tables. And that actually advantages, especially in scalable environment, because it's gonna dynamically learning those routing information so that can automatically do the network discovery and maintenance without manually uh, a network administrator or a system administrator has to go in and enter in those static routes. So that is one of the advantages of using dynamic routing protocols. So let's look at a dynamic routes in the routing table of a Cisco router. Again, we're gonna use the same command show IP route. So in here, we have OSPF is now being used in our sample topology to dynamically learn all the networks connected to R1 and R2. The routing table entries use the status code of O, which is the symbol O that on the left hand side to indicate the route was learned by OSPF routing protocol. Both entries use uh, sorry, both entries also include the IP address of the next hop router via the IP address um, information. Please note the IPv6 routing protocols use the link local address of the next hop router. And also note that the OSPF routing configuration for IPv4 and IPv6 is beyond the scope of this course. This is part of the advanced routing course, as I mentioned. There are certain things that overlaps 
in this course with the course for advanced routing, which I will have a separate lecture series posted to my YouTube channel later sometime, uh, maybe next month or so. But in this course, we are still in, uh, we will cover some of the topics related to OSPF, but will not go into any depth other than just looking at some of the configurations uh, for understanding routing purposes, right? So in this case, we have the Cisco router and we have issued the show IP route command. And we can see the OSPF routes showing up here, which are type of um, OSPF is a type of uh, routing protocol that can be used for dynamically learning uh, those uh, uh, routes, right? So remember from our previous slides, dynamic routing ha have multiple protocols. So OSPF is one of them. In this example, we happen to have that OSPF set up and we see that information showing up right here on the most left-hand side. We have O indicating that is a dynamically learned OSPF route in that routing table. So for this course, as I mentioned before, we will not discuss OSPF, but I will discuss the OSPF in much more detail in depth in our advanced routing course coming up next. Default route. The default route specify a next hop router to use when the routing table does not contain a specific route that matches the destination IP address. A default route can be either a static route or learn automatically from a down dynamic routing protocol such as OSPF we just look over. A default route has an IPv4 route entry of 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 or an IPv6 route entry of colon colon slash 0. This basically means that the 0 or no bits need to match between the destination IP address and the default route. Remember, because it's all set to zero, see both in IPv4 and IPv6, that basically translate to zero or no bits needed to be matches between the destination IP address and the default route. So in this diagram, on the bottom of your screen, you have the IP uh, so, uh, addresses set up on this side and IP address set up on that side. And we have the default route is set up so that it has the this router one has a default route all the way to the ISPs to the internet. So there is a connection between the internet ISP router and the router one through that default route. So that's what it's actually try to display here. Structure of an IPv4 routing table. So IPv4 was standardized using the now obsolete classful addressing architecture. The IPv4 routing table is organized using the same classful structure. Although the lookup process no longer uses classes, the structure of the IPv4 routing table still retains this format. An indented entry is known as a child route. A route entry is indented if it is the subnet of a class fools address, such as class A, class B, or class C network. So remember that an indented entry is known as a child route. A route entry is indented if it is the subnet of a class fools address. Directly connected networks will always be indented also known as the child routes, because the local address of the interface is always entered in the routing table as slash 32. The child route will include the route source and the forwarding information such as the next hop address, as I mentioned in previous slides as well. So the class full network address of this subnet will be shown above the route entry less indented and without a source code. The route is known as a parent route. So that route in this case is known as a parent route. So the class full network address of subnet will be shown above that route entry and not indented or less indented and without a source code and that is known as a parent route. 
and I will actually show you a um, image, a screenshot of that uh, given to us by Cisco on our next slide. So right here, we have run the show IP route command and we came up with a bunch of data that we are looking at uh, right here. So an intended entry is known as a child route, right? A route entry is intended if it is the subnet of a classful address, as I mentioned on from my previous slide. And you can see that right here, these are intended entries right here, intended entry right here, intended entry right here. So those are the ones there. The directly connected networks will always be intended or child routes because the local address of the interface is always entered in the routing table as slash 32s. So if you look at slash 32s, that's showing directly connected and that's showing as a little bit, bit indented. Right here it says L, but it is indented. It's not right here, it's indented one more time, right? So that's right. So the child route will include the route source, all the forwarding information such as the next hop address. The classful network address of this subnet will be shown above the route entry, less indented and without a source code and that route will is known as the parent route. So that so this is less indented, and that will be considered as a parent route. So again, I will go through them on a real lab demo live lab demonstration and post to my YouTube channel on a separate video, and that's going to happen for next few slides as well. So the concept of um, uh, classful addressing was never part of the IPv6. So right now we are looking at the structure of an IPv6 routing table as opposed to IPv4 routing table. Remember on Cisco IOS, if you type show IP route, that will give you IPv4 routing table. But if you change this IP to IPv6, show IPv6 route, that will show you the IPv6 routing table. And in this case, we are not using the classful addressing because that was never part of the IPv6 when it was implemented. So the structure of an IPv6 routing table is very straightforward. Every IPv6 route entry is formatted and aligned the exactly the same way. So every single, see, this is an entry, this is an entry, this is an entry, this is an entry. And all of the entries have the same indentation and it will just give you the information such as directly connected or uh, otherwise uh, or with that uh, routing entries. So those are the two differences, like so those are the differences of two types, the IPv4 routing table and the IPv6 routing table. Administrative distance. Again, this become more important in our advanced routing classes that I will be doing in the next few months. But you should still know what an administrative distance and how it works and at least basic concepts associated with it. So I will go over that in next few slides so that you have a better understanding uh, for your uh, exams and quizzes for this class. So a route entry for a specific network address prefix and the prefix length can only appear once in the routing table. However, it is possible that the routing table learns about the same network address from more than one routing source, except for very specific uh, situations, only one dynamic routing protocol should be implemented on a router. So except in very specific cases, which I go over later uh, in a separate uh, course and video, only one dynamic routing protocol should be implemented on a router. Each routing protocol may decide on a different path to reach destination based on the metric of that routing protocol. This raises few questions. They include how does the router knows which source to use and which route should it install in the routing table, right? So the Cisco IOS uses what is known as the administrative distance, also known as AD, to determine the route to install into the IP routing table. The AD represents the trustworthiness of the route. The lower the AD or the administrative distance, the more trustworthy that, that route source going to be. So as I mentioned before, lower is better in this situation. The table on the right hand side list various routing protocols and their associated administrative distances. For this course, 
you don't need to know what these routing protocols and various uh, routing methods and the administrative distance. Only thing you need to know is the lower the administrative distance, better it is. You don't need to know these things. However, you have a basic idea that there are different routing protocols such as EIGRP, BGP, OSPF, RIP, uh, ex uh, and internal BGP, etc., etc. And the administrative distance uh, uh, is different for each one of them. So if there is static route configured and you also have the OSPF uh, route, it's always going to prefer the static route because that has the lowest administrative distance compared to OSPF, for example. Uh, I will go through BGP, EIGRP, OSPF, uh, and um, um, RIP in an advanced routing course. But for now, just know that there are different protocols and the administrative distance always increase as, you know, as you go away from the directly connected and static route. So directly connected and static route has the lowest administrative distance. Therefore, that would be the first preference. These two are the first preference. That's what you need to know in this class. Static and dynamic routing. Static or dynamic? So static and dynamic routing are not mutually exclusive. Rather, most networks use a combination of dynamic routing protocols and static routes. So the answer to whether static or dynamic in most networks, it should be both. So static routes are commonly used in the following scenarios. As a default route forwarding packets to a service provider, such as an ISP in this example, uh, for routes that are outside the routing domain and not learned by the dynamic routing protocols. When the network administrator wants to explicitly define the path for a specific network, and you can also use it for routing between sub -net, uh, stub networks. So those are reasons why static routes are commonly used in a network. Static routes are useful for smaller networks with only one path to an outside network. So only one path to the ISP or the internet or your outside uh, uh, campus. They also provide security in a large network for certain types of traffic or links to other networks that need more control. As I mentioned, like having a two side, uh, campuses uh, connecting to each other, you can use a static route. So it provides more security. Uh, making a, la a connection between those large networks and uh, it provides that uh, control, more administration control of that system. Dynamic routing protocols are implemented in any type of network consisting of more than just a few routers. So dynamic routing protocols are scalable and automatically determines better routes if there is a change in the topology. Remember, the as the the English term dynamic, what it it really means is is it's very dynamic. It's going to automatically determine the better routes if there's a change in topology. So administrator doesn't have to go and change anything in the, um, the configurations of routers uh, if the topology changes. So dynamic routing protocols are commonly used in these scenarios. So in network consisting of more than just uh, a few routers, so you have multiple routers uh, across your campus network, for example. When a change in the network topology requires the network to automatically determine another path, so instead of an administrator going and changing everything, you can quickly, you know, this will automatically decide everything. For scalability, therefore, as a result, scalability. So as the network grows, the dynamic routing protocol automatically learns about any net new networks, so you don't have to go around and change all the configurations. So the table shows the comparison of some differences between dynamic and static routing. And for your exams and quizzes in this class and this course through Cisco CCNA or through your academic institution, you should know the differences between dynamic routing and static routing very well. So this is a really good slide that you can pause or take a screenshot of and know these two differences. So uh, these two, for example, dynamic routing and static routing, has uh, different uh, configuration complexity. So the dynamic routing is independent of the network site, but the static routing increases with the network size. So topology changes, as I mentioned, dynamic routing automatic, 
static routing, the administrator, you as a human, has to uh, do the uh, topology changes required uh, configurations. Scalability, again, because it is automatically doing everything for dynamic routing, for topology changes and everything, it is highly scalable. It's very easy to implement in a complex system. Static routing is suitable for simple topologies, not very complex ones. Security, uh, dynamic routing, you need to be careful with your security. The security must be properly configured. But static route, because you are using static route, the known routes to your administrator, you, it is more secure, it is inherently secure. Uh, the resource usage, the CPU usage, memory usage, and uh, you know bandwidth is higher on dynamic routing. Uh, but in static routing, it, the usage of CPU is lower because it doesn't need to always look for that information. Uh, path uh, predictability, uh, route depends on topology and routing protocol use, right? So the, in dynamic routing, if you are using OSPF, for example, when you learn how to do that in my next future lecture series, uh, you know, it's going to use uh, whatever the OSPF methodology to get the path, right? So it is not very predictable. But uh, I mean, it is predictable based on uh, the type of um, methodology you use, but it's not as predictable as is the static route because we are explicitly defining uh, the path in static routing. So therefore, path predictability is very easy because it's explicitly defined by the administrator. Dynamic routing evolution. Dynamic routing protocols have been used in networks since late 1980s. And one of the first routing protocols was the RIP. RIP version one was released in 1988, but some of the basic algorithms within the protocols were used on the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, also known as ARPNET and so as early as 1969. So the RIP version one was released in 1988. However, uh, it has been in testing under the Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency as early as 1969. As networks evolve and become more complex, new routing protocols emerge as with any other technology. So this diagram that you're seeing on the bottom of the screen, we have, the RIP version 1 that came out in 1988 as a standard. Uh, we had EIGRP and IGRP as later, early as 1982. And then as it, we pro progress to 1990s and 2000, you can see different technologies coming up. And some of them are still in use and we still use it. Like for example, we still use, um, you know, uh, OSPF. Uh, EIGRP, BGP, those are things and uh, we still use, uh, especially OSPF version 3. So, and we will cover those topics uh, in our advanced routing lecture series that uh, I will be posting on my YouTube channel later uh, sometime. But for now, what you need to know is the dynamic routing uh, protocols have been evolving since as early as 1969. So the table classifies the current routing protocols uh, in use. So the interior gateway protocol, also known as IGPS, are routing protocols used to exchange routing information within a routing domain administered by a single organization. There is only one EGP and it is called BGP. And BGP is used to exchange routing information between different organizations known as autonomous systems, also is in short and AS. BGP is used by ISPs even today to route packets over the internet, distance vector link state, and path vector routing protocols refer to the types of routing algorithms used to determine that best path. So in here, we have the interior gateway protocols listed currently in use for IPv4 and IPv6. So IPv4, we have RIP2 and uh, RIPing, R-E-P-N-G. And we have EIGRP and EIGRP uh, for uh, IPv6. For link states, we have uh, OSPF version 2 and uh, IESIS, and then we had OSPF version 3, which is for the IPv6. 
and ISIS for the IPv6. And for exterior gateways, we have the BGP4 and the BGP MP. So for your exams, labs, and quizzes for this class, this is the important table that you should remember because Cisco could ask you during your exams or quizzes, um, what is the difference between OSPF V2 and OSPF V3? They're not gonna ask you any more details than what we have shown on here on this bottom of this screen. So uh, the, uh, uh, if you are going, taking this class through an academic institution, listen to whatever your instructor has to say about your exams and quizzes. But as far as the Cisco NetAcad exams goes, most of the questions gonna be like, uh, you have a link state protocol, uh, pick which one of these are for IPv6. So they will give you RIP2, IEIGRP, OSPF version 2, BGP4, and OSPF version 3. And you should be able to say, oh yeah, OSPF version 3 is for IPv6. And you should be able to pick up that out from a multiple choice exam, for example, right? So you need to know that. Uh, and that is an important concept. And another important concept is that the BGP is used to exchange routing information between different organizations and they are known as the autonomous systems, also known as AS. So, and it is used by uh, modern day ISPs to route packet over the internet. Dynamic routing protocol concepts. A routing protocol is a set of processes, algorithms and messages that are used to exchange routing information and populate the routing table with the choice of best paths. The purpose of dynamic routing protocols include the following. Discovery of remote networks, maintaining up-to-date routing information, choosing the best path to destination networks, ability to find a new best path if the current path is no longer available. So those are the four key concepts associated with the dynamic routing protocols. The main components of dynamic routing uh, protocols includes the following. Data structures. So routing protocols typically use tables or databases for their operations. This information is kept in RAM. So RAM of your router, for example. Routing protocol messages. So the routing protocols use various types of messages to discover neighboring routers, exchange routing information, and other tasks to learn and maintain accurate information about the network. And the algorithm. So an algorithm is a finite set of steps used to accomplish a task. Routing protocols use algorithms for facilitating routing information and for the best path determination. So if you are taking any programming classes, you learn in there also that the algorithm is a finite list of steps that you take to solve a problem, right? So routing protocols is basically solving a problem and it has its own types of algorithms that it's gonna use based on the type of dynamic routing protocol in use. So routing protocols determine the best path or the route to each network. That route is then offered to the routing table. The route will be installed in the routing table if there is no other routing source with lower administrative distance. Remember, the lowest administrative distance take precedence in routing tables, right? So it's from previous slides that we have gone over. So best path. Uh, so the best path is selected by a routing protocol based on the value or metric it uses to determine the distance to reach the network. So a metric is the quantitative value used to measure the distance to a given network. So you should know that. And the best path to a network is the path with the, with the lowest metric. So those are key concepts. So the metric, is the quantitative value used to measure the distance to a given network, while the best path is a network that has the lowest metric. Dynamic routing protocols typically use their own rules and metrics to build and update routing tables. The following table lists common dynamic protocols 
and their matrices. So on the bottom of your screen, you have the routing protocol listed on the left-hand side and the matrix that it will be using. So routing information protocol, also known as RIP, uses the uh, matrix uh, called the hop count. So each router along a path adds a hop to the hop count. Uh, a maximum of 15 hops are allowed and the lowest hop count would be have the best uh, option for the uh, the uh, for the network right so the best path would be the lowest hop count open shortest path first also known as ospf e, that one that protocol uses uh, the metric cost which is based on the cumulative bandwidth from source to the de destination so it's going to calculate the cost associated with the uh, distance uh, so the network connection between the source to the destination so that is based on the cumulative bandwidth faster links are assigned lower cost compared to the slower links that will have the higher cost so the links with the fastest bandwidth gonna get the lowest cost and hence the priority for the best path as opposed to slower links that will gonna have a higher cost you need to you know, in your brain, you need to opposite think, you know. This is something that trips some of the students. So uh, this is why I'm highlighting this. See, on the exams, sometimes you automatically think, okay, if it has a, uh, you know, slower rate of data, so transmission, so that means slower bandwidth, shouldn't it have the lower cost? No, it has the higher cost. Because in OSPF, remember, as always, lowest cost gonna have a higher rate of bandwidth and the slowest uh, 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 you know higher cost gonna have a slower rate of bandwidth because as i mentioned again and again the best path network the best uh, you know best path to a network is the part with the lowest metric right so that means the best that means highest bandwidth gonna have the highest uh, sorry lowest cost associated so that would be the best path so the next one is the enhanced interior gateway routing protocol also known as eigrp it calculates the matrix based on the slowest uh, bandwidth and delay values in this case it could also include load and uh, reliability into the uh, matrix calculation and again uh, that has a different matrix calculation compared to the other two so in here what you need to remember is you should remember all of these three protocols what matrix is used like for example rip use hop count open uh, shortest path first also known as ospf commonly uh, use the matrix called cost calculation that is based on the bandwidth and you should know the lower cost uh, compared to the slower cost and how the, it is assigned so the low, slower network have a higher cost value you should know that and you should also know eigrp and how it calculates matrix based on the slowest bandwidth and the delay value but it also include load and reliability into the matrix calculation so it has that all built into that so that should be what really important for your exams and quizzes and your understanding about these different routing protocols please 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 for your exams and quizzes, do not get confused about these hop counts and how matrix values are assigned. So don't get confused that, you know, faster links have a higher value. No, in here, for example, OSP, it is always the faster links that are going to get the lower cost value because we are using the lowest cost for the network for the best path, right? So remember that. So that is something a lot of people get confused. Load balancing. When a router has two or more parts to a destination with equal cost matrix, then the router forwards the packets using both parts equally. This is called equal cost load balancing. The routing table contains the single destination network, but has multiple exit interfaces. Remember egress, exit, egress interfaces so router routing table ha contains a single destination network but has multiple exit interfaces one of for each cost path so 
each cost path is going to have an interface associated with that. The route of forwards packets using the multiple exit interfaces listed in the routing table. So if configured correctly, the load balancing can increase the effectiveness and performance of the network. Equal cost load balancing is implemented automatically by the dynamic routing protocols. It is enabled with static routes when there are multiple static routes on the same destination network using different next stop routers. So with the dynamic routing protocols, it's gonna be automatically enabled. But with static route, if you have more than one static route, so that means multiple static route to the same destination, then the network will use different next, uh, you know, load it will still use the load balancing using those different static routes that configured in that router. Please not only EIGRP support unequal cost load balancing. Again, I am not going into depth and detail on OSPF and EIGRP for a very good reason. Because in this particular lecture series, in this particular lectures that we are going over right now, you do not need to know specifics of EIGRP, how we can implement EIGRP and OSPF. What you need to know is the basic high level overview in this module. I will cover EIGRP and OSPF in extensive depth in future lectures, but for now, this is all you need to know. So that would bring us to the end of this lecture. And I will go over what we have learned and covered in this module in next slide. We learn the primary functions of a routers are to determine the best path to forward packets based on the information in its routing table and to forward packets towards their destination. The best path in the routing table is also known as the longest match. The longest match is the route in the routing table that has the greatest number of, four of far left matching bits with the destination IP address of the packet. Directly connected networks are networks that are configured on the active interfaces of a router. A directly connected network is added to the routing table when an interface is configured with an IP address and subnet mask, also known as prefix length, and is active. In other words, the link is up and running. Routers learn about remote networks in two ways. We learn about static routes, and also we learn about dynamic routing protocols. After a router determines the correct path, it can forward the packet on a directly connected network. It can forward the packet to the next top router, or it can for forward, uh, sorry, or it can drop the packet, right? So we learn that as well. So if the, once a router determines the correct path, it has the choice of uh, forwarding that data to the directly connected network or it can send it to the next top router or it can drop it. So it can make that decision for that packet. Routers support three packet forwarding mechanisms. They include process switching, fast switching, and CEF. And I went over the differences of those three and make sure you know that the differences of those three for not only for your lecture exams, but also for your lab exams, your instructor could ask you a few questions on that. There are several configuration and verification commands for routers uh, that include show IP route, show IP interface, show IP interface brief, and show running config. And we also learn if you would like to look at the IPv6 routing tables or routing information, we can use show IPv6 route, show IPv6 interface, and show IPv6 interface brief. That will also give you the IPv6 uh, data if you would like to look at that from your Cisco router. We learn about routing table, uh, that um, how the routing tables contains a list of routers um, uh, sorry, list of routes known uh, networks that includes prefixes, prefix lens. We learn about the source of the, this information is delivered from directly connected networks, static routes, and dynamic routing protocols. We learn that every router makes its decision alone based on the information it has in his own routing table. The information in a routing table 
of one router does not necessarily match the routing table of another router. So we learn uh, how just because of you have the information on routing on one single routing table on a one single router that can in the same network, the next router connected to the same network may not have the same information. Routing information about a path does not provide return routing information. In other words, if you have a source and a destination, if there are information to send data from uh, the uh, source to the destination through the routing table already built, it doesn't necessarily mean the destination now can send data back with the same information. Doesn't also mean that the router knows the path uh, back to the uh, the source uh, uh, section, right? So that's what that means. So the routing uh, table entries include the route source, the destination network, administrative distance, also known as AD, metric, next hop, route timestamp, and exit interface. We learn about static routes are manually configured and define an explicit path between two networking devices. And we also learned that the static route had to be entered by administrators in most cases. Dynamic routing protocols can discover a network, maintain routing tables, select a best path, and automatically discover a new best path if the topology changes. So if the topology changes in the static route, administrator has to fix that, but in dynamic routing protocols, you don't need to do that. It will automatically do it itself. The default route specifies a next hop router to use when the routing table does not contain a specific route that matches the destination IP address. So we learn a default route can be either a static route or learn automatically from a dynamic routing protocol. We also learn about IPv4 routing tables still have a structure based on a classful addressing represented by levels of indentations when you, you know, when you go do show routes. So the IPv6 routing tables do not use the IPv4 routing table structure because it does, it is classless, right? IPv6 is classless and the IPv4 is classful. Cisco IOS, which is a software that or firmware within your Cisco routers, uses what is known as the administrative distance, also known as AD, to determine the route to install in the IP routing table. The AD represents the trustworthiness of the route. The lower the AD, the more trustworthy the route source. Static routes are commonly used as a default route forwarding packets to a service provider. For routes outside this routing domain and not learned by the dynamic routing protocol. When the network administrator wants to explicitly define the path for a specific network or for routing between uh, stub networks. So remember that. Again, I wanna repeat that point again. The static routes are commonly used as a default route forwarding packets to service provider for routes outside the routing domain and not learned by the dynamic routing protocol when the administ network administrator wants to explicitly define the path for a specific network or for routing between stub uh, networks. So remember those key features. Dynamic routing protocols are commonly used in network consisting of more than just few routers. When a change in the network topology requires the network to automatically determine the another path and for scalability. So that's why we use the dynamic routing protocols. As the network grows, the dynamic routing protocol will automatically learn about a, a, any new networks. We learned the current routing protocols includes IGPS and EGPS. EGPS exchange routing information within a routing domain administrated by a single organization. Only EIG, sorry, only EGP is BGP and BGP exchanges uh, routing information between uh, different organizations. BGP is currently used by ISP to route packets over the internet. We learn about the distance vector, link state, and path vector routing protocols refer to the type of routing algorithm used to determine the best path. But however, again, in this module, we don't go into depth. This is just a high level overview. So just know these 
you know, link state, uh, uh, distance vector, etc., etc., do exist and what they are for. We learned the main components of dynamic routing protocols are data structures, routing protocol messages, and algorithms. We learned the best path is selected by routing protocol based on the value or matrix it used to determine the distance to reach a network. And the best path to a network is the path with the lowest matrix, you know, every single time. When a router has two or more paths to a destination with equal cost matrix, then the router forwards the package packets using both paths equally. This is called equal cost load balancing. So if you have two parts available in the router with the same equal cost matrix, then the router forwards a package using both parts equally. Hence, it is called the equal cost load balancing. If you like these type of lectures, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the topics that we have covered in this module or previous module, please reach out to me and I will try to answer all your questions. Make sure to go over all your lecture notes and everything before you take your quiz or exam. Good luck with your exams and have a nice day.